Okay, so now our next speaker, member of the fire team, is David Siegel. He comes to us from UC Davis, and he will be talking about reactivation of UBE 3A. Okay, thank you. Can you all hear me? Um, so we'll see if I could use this, or else I may just have to say next slide. Oh, I need to point it that way. Oh, look, it works. Okay. So uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today was just a, a few short stories about some work that's in progress in our lab today and, uh, and give you an overview of, of how things are going. So um, as many of you know, um, we've been trying to develop a kind of transcription factor therapy for Angelman syndrome. And uh, the basis of this, of this therapy is thinking about um, how nature works. So, we know that, that we have this situation in Angelman syndrome where there's a silenced paternal allele that's intact, but it's silenced. And so, you know, we started to ask the question of how we could use what we know about biology to try to address this, this issue. And one of the ways that, uh, that our cells regulate which genes are turned on or turned off is through the use of transcription factors. So we have, um, Transcription factors like this uh, that will, uh, it's a protein that will bind to a, a, a piece of DNA near a gene. And uh, it can either activate that gene or, or turn that gene off. And so we are trying to use the same kind of tools that nature has, is already using uh, in the case of Angelman syndrome. Um, but we're able to do that by, uh, by designing uh, the DNA binding domain so we can direct them to a, spe a specific part on the DNA. And so in our case, we're going to make a factor that um, we're going to put in. And in what I'm going to show you today, it's going to uh, land just about there uh, and shut off this antisense transcript somewhat, uh, allowing expression of UBE3A. So I've talked about this a few times before. and. Uh, I, I mentioned that we were able to build a protein. Um, this is our protein production, and that we can inject this uh, artificial transcription factor into UB3A deficient mice, uh, an Angelman mouse model. And um, in this case, I'm just showing you, I'm just cutting right to the end here to show this data that I think I've showed uh, several times before, where uh, we can inject this um, into the mouse, not directly into the brain, but into the kind of body of the mouse. It's able to cross the blood-brain barrier, enter the neurons in the brain. And here I'm showing um, uh, UB3A expression is in green here. So this is hippocampus and cerebellum uh, sections from uh, a wild-type mouse that expresses UB3A. This is the Angelman syndrome mouse not expressing UB3A here. And then uh, when we put in our therapeutic protein, we can see that the levels are, are turned on, kind of more like wild type. Uh, but if we put in a protein that's just a little bit different in its DNA binding domain, uh, you don't see the UBE3A coming on. And then we can quantitate that. We can show uh, the protein levels with the so-called Western blot. And we could see that when we treat them, we also see an increase in the UBE3A protein by that method as well. So. Um, we know that we have the ability to turn this gene on in the brains of mice, and that's very exciting. We also know that it has a fairly widespread distribution in the brain, and I think this is really um, an important uh, benefit of our process, that we were able to successfully not only introduce this, that it crosses the blood-brain barrier, but it also distributes very widely in the brain. So at the time that I was starting this work, um, it looked like other kinds of vectors, like viral vectors, had a somewhat more limited distribution. But I think um, maybe uh, Kevin in the next talk will offer his insight on that at the current state. But let's say uh, in this case, um, we were getting some very nice distribution that you could see uh, this intense red signal in brains that were treated compared to this kind of duller uh, in brains that were not treated. But um, we were also able to measure the, the kinetics of, of how the protein came in. Um, because there was a fluorescent protein on, as part of our protein, uh, we were able to do live animal imaging. And we could actually see the fluorescence uh, through the, the, the skulls of these uh, mice that have shaved heads. So this, the mice are alive. 
um, but we just shave the head, the, the hair, so that it doesn't interfere with this fluorescence signal. And then we have a machine that can actually read uh, when the protein is, is there in the brain by measuring that fluorescence signal. And so we're able to measure um, how soon it gets in and how soon it gets out. And basically what we found is that um, uh, it has a peak of, of uh, after we inject it, it gets into the brain fairly quickly. But then after 24 hours or so, it's almost all out. And so, you know, it's, we know that it has activity, but it doesn't have a very long activity. And so this has kind of set up uh, an important challenge in our research that we're trying to address this year. So the concern is that, um, you know, if there's a relatively short duration, uh, you know, we would inject, maybe we would get some level of UV3A reactivation, but then it would go down. And so to show that, the picture that I showed before with all the, the brain tissue lighting up like that, um, what we did is we were injecting three times a week for four weeks. So that's a lot of injections, and that's a lot of protein as well. Uh, so it became very problematic you know, to think about trying to move that kind of a, a therapy uh, towards clinical trial. So what we would really like um, is to have a more persistent effect, to have something where you inject it and it has a, a longer duration of action. Um, Ideally, it would be great if we could just inject something once, and then everything would, all the UV3A levels would come up, and we could just uh, walk away and not have to do retreatments. So how can we do something like that? So this is story number one. Story number one is about epigenetics. And again, our goal here is to increase the persistence of, uh, of, this, um, of this therapy. So in all the cells of our body, uh, nature has also provided us some insight on how to achieve um, persistent changes in gene regulation. And we know that just by studying life. So um, if we think about you know, this so-called central dogma of biology where DNA makes RNA and it makes proteins, you could think of the genome as a kind of library. So it has all the genes that we need in all cells of our body, but not every cell needs all those proteins. So for example, um, the difference between a nerve cell and a muscle cell are the, the proteins that are expressed. And so we, if we think of the genome as all possible genes, um, any, any particular cell type might only express some of those genes. And the other genes, it kind of puts in long-term storage. So if, again, if you're a neuron, you don't need to express liver enzymes. So the, the cell will turn off those liver enzyme genes so that those cells are not expressed ever in neurons. So the way, the mechanism that the cell uh, keeps these genes repressed um, has to do with this field of epigenetics. So the DNA in our cells is always complexed with some other types of proteins. Um, and uh, these proteins, we could call them histone proteins or nucleosomes. These proteins uh, are always wrapped around the DNA, and they have little tails that come out from them. And um, these tails are chemically modified by other enzymes that are in the cell. And depending on what modification, what chemical group is attached to these proteins, uh, that constitutes a kind of epigenetic code. Uh, so we call that epigenetics because it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of wrapped around the DNA. This, this information is not encoded in the DNA, but it's uh, surrounding the DNA. So we call it epigenetic. And, and it's basically a, a chemical code, like I say. So uh, genes that are active have certain types of chemical modifications on those proteins. And, uh, genes that are silenced have a different kind of chemical modification on their proteins that are wrapping around the DNA. So this constitutes the so-called epigenetic code or epigenetic regulation. Now, th through many studies, uh, the scientific community has identified the proteins that are responsible for writing this information or erasing this epigenetic information. And so now we can make uh, artificial transcription factors that take advantage of this information. And so, uh, so looking at it from a cartoon, um, it looks a lot like what I showed you before, but 
I can only tell you that now uh, this is not just is not going to just be affecting uh, the expression of the gene in a transient kind of way. What we're hoping to achieve here is uh, is doing the same thing that nature does when it tries to shut down genes uh, in, a, in a persistent way. We're trying to use that same machinery now so that we can shut down this antisense transcript in a more uh, persistent way. And so again, we're going to make some artificial transcription factors that now contain some of these epigenetic modifying enzymes. And we have good reason to suspect that this will work, because this is actually already happening at the Angelman locus. So uh, on, on these genes uh, on the maternal allele that are shut off, they're epigenetically silenced. Uh, we know that they have uh, DNA methylation, which is a type of epigenetic information, um, in this uh, imprinting control center. And, uh, and in fact, that forms the basis for one of the main diagnostic tests for Angelman syndrome. Uh, in addition to the uh, DNA methylation that we know a lot about, uh, we also know that there's um, some chemical changes to the, to the histone proteins that wrap around that DNA. And uh, we should be able to kind of recreate uh, what's going on over here. And all we want to do is be able to get that to happen right over there. Now, Nature plays a very elegant game, and most of it we don't understand. But we're trying to do something that we think is much more focused. We just want to change the epigenetic information just right there. And uh, we think that we can do this with this targeting technology. So here I'm showing you some, some new data that came from my lab where we took some of these epigenetic uh, enzymes and attached them to our uh, artificial transcription factor and what this is showing is, um, so these are uh, cells, mouse cells. And in these cells, um, if this is the, the normal expression of this uh, gene, this extra, the SNRPN gene, we're uh, kind of near where that antisense transcript is originating. Um, if this is the level that we see in an untreated cell, uh, when we put in our, um, our, our, that same repressor that I showed you in the earlier studies, uh, we see you know, maybe a half of the UB3A is, is, is uh, well, half of the transcription of this uh, gene has gone down. And, um, and when we use these epigenetic repressors, this group uh, out here at the end, we also see a decrease in gene expression, so that's good. And particularly this one that we're calling FOG1, um, it seems like the repression is as good or, or better than the thing that I showed you before that was giving that great expression of UB3A in the brains of the mice. Now, what we're not showing here is if this is persistent. So I just got these results a, a week or so ago. And now we're going to test to see if this is going to give a persistent effect that we could maybe just treat this area once. Hopefully, we've deposited some epigenetic information in that area. And now, when our factor goes away, uh, the gene expression levels will just be set the way that we've set them. Now, this data is in cells, and we're going to look at persistence in cells. But of course, we also want to look at um, persistence in the mice. Um, actually, that's all I wanted to say. So you know, uh, we're going from uh, like a, a cell environment, which is you know, very removed from the real situation. And of course, we have to you know, then go back to our uh, tested in our, our preclinical tool, the mouse. So story number two is a different way of addressing the problem. Um, well, let's not call it a problem. Say it's a challenge. Um, this would have to do with in situ production. And in situ production is just a fancy way of saying that we're going to make it where it's being used. So one advantage that, uh, that you know, trying to use a protein as a therapeutic, we could call that a biologic. One advantage that this biologic should have over, say, drug therapy is that our bodies make proteins. Uh, so you know, we don't make drugs. Drugs have to be synthesized, and then they have to be introduced. Now, we're using our protein as a drug. We're making it someplace, and then we're introducing it. But in principle, uh, we could engineer our body or our mouse to make this compound, this protein. And then it should you know, just be made where it's going to be used. Uh, so we should be able to use that to our advantage, too. And I think um, you're going to hear uh, a little bit about uh, making UBE3A that way in the next talk. 
but for our transcription factor, uh, we've been looking at this into several ways of how we could um, get the brain to make uh, this protein so that it doesn't have to be made and injected into the mouse on a regular interval, but it's just going to be made right there and then used right there. So one of the, one of the ways that I can, I can share with you a little bit about today um, is, uh, is a cell-based delivery. So the idea of a cell-based delivery is we introduce this into some cells, put those cells into the brain, and now those cells will, ex will uh, excrete that protein into the brain and, uh, and then will be taken up by cells around it, or taken up by the neurons. So in this case, we're using uh, a cell type called a, a mesenchymal stem cell or mesenchymal stem cell uh, because this is being used already therapeutically um, for some treatments. Um, particularly, uh, we've collaborated with uh, Dr. Jan Nolta at UC Davis, who's a, a recognized stem cell expert and uh, with expertise in, in these mesenchymal stem cells. And they can put them into brains. And the cells will get in, they will migrate around within the brain, they will secrete uh, whatever they're designed to secrete and, uh, and affect the neurons there. And so, um, so we've now uh, engineered some of these mesenchymal stem cells uh, using a, a viral vector to contain our protein. And what I'm going to show you is going to be our TADS1 protein, the same protein that activated UB3A in the brains of the mice. And now we're going to have these cells make it and we're going to put them into the brain. So, so I'm not showing you... Uh, what's them in the brain yet, but these are just these cells in a culture dish. And what I want to show you in this movie is that the cells are moving around, so hopefully you can see that. So the red color here is the red fluorescent protein that's, that's part of our therapeutic protein, and so you can see that these cells are making a lot of that protein, and you can see how they migrate around. They really crawl, so this is on a dish, but you can see them crawling around uh, over this time-lapse photography. And so the idea is that they're supposed to, um, you know, give us that same kind of widespread distribution throughout the brain that we think is going to be important since we know that UB3A expression throughout the brain is affected. If you look at this long enough, you can actually see cells uh, balling up, dividing, and then settling back out. So that's, that's story number two. Now, story number three is, uh, is getting back to animal models. So as you know, um, uh, the experiments that I've talked about today have all been in cell culture. And there's certainly a lot of advantages of working with uh, cells for kind of uh, you know, learning about things and, and trying to try different things. But after that, we really need to move into some kind of a live animal. So we could try to move into this live animal, but, um, but we, we probably have to work with some kind of an animal model first. And so uh, you've heard a lot about the mouse studies now and, uh, and a lot of progress being made there. And you know, up until now, the mouse has really been the, uh, the preeminent model on this pathway between cells and human, uh, apart from things like flies and other kinds of model organisms like uh, Dr. Dindo had just talked about. But uh, we had also said, as the fire team, that we were going to make um, a Angelman syndrome rat model and an Angelman syndrome pig model. So uh, Dr. Dindo just told you the update on the pig model. And I'm, I'm proud to announce today that we have the rat model now. So we have the first rat model of Angelman syndrome. So, uh, so the initial parts of this project were actually started uh, earlier, uh, a lot earlier this year in my lab, uh, designing the strategy for uh, excising this UB3A gene. So we're using some targetable nucleases to do this. And uh, we're going to make cuts on either side of the gene and, uh, and just take the whole UB3A gene out on this chromosome. Um, and so we designed these parts, and then uh, we gave them to this company, Transposigen, to inject into mouse, uh, sorry, into rat embryos. So uh, the way these experiments are done is, you know, th these things are designed, and then um, they're injected into a one-celled embryo. Uh, so you, uh, it's the one-celled stage of the animal. 
And it goes in and it, it cuts out the UBE3A gene. And then uh, that cell can be grown up, uh, continued its development into a mouse. And so out of that, we're able to get animals. And some of those animals will contain the deletion that we're interested in. So the injections were done in, in June. And the first animals were, were born in, uh, in July. And this gave us the so-called founder animals. So uh, the founder animals, some of them, well, uh, some of these animals will contain the, the deletion, and then some don't. So they need to be genotyped when they get a little bit older so that we can actually see if they have the deletion or not. Um, so from some large number of, uh, of embryo injections that they did, then uh, some fewer uh, were born as the founder animals. Uh, but then uh, there, there can be, um, there's always a question of if this, uh, even if we see that the mice have the deletion, if they're going to be able to transmit that deletion to their offspring. And so you know, this deletion will be continued through the mice. So they don't really consider the project successful until we get to the next generation, the so-called F1 generation, um, which are the descendants of this founder animals. And so the first F1s were born just in November, uh, or that's October, I guess. And then um, they had to grow a little bit before they could be genotyped. But now we know for sure that we have F1s that, um, that contain this deletion, which means that uh, now we're ready to start studying them. So I think the company uh, did a great job for us in creating these rats. And now uh, it's our turn to take over and start uh, doing all this kind of phenotypic characterization that you heard about from Dr. Weber and Dr. Anderson. We're going to need to uh, measure the behavioral phenotypes as well as the neurologic phenotypes. And what we really need to determine early on is you know, how much better this model will be than the mouse model. Because of course, a lot of work has already gone on into the mouse model. Uh, so it's the thing that we know. But uh, our hope, of course, as we have said all along, is that the rats should be a much more better cognitive model and behavioral model and uh, should allow us to advance our research uh, beyond what we've been able to do up to now. And of course, we want to make this resource as widely available as possible so that other investigators in the field can take advantage of this new tool. So with that, um, I just want to uh, point out the people in my lab who have done a lot of this work. So in particular, the people circled in green um, have worked on the Angelman uh, our, our, uh, artificial transcription factor therapy, particularly uh, Barbara Bayless, uh, Barbara Bayless. <laughs> and, uh, and Ben Piles in my lab. And um, these are also some, uh, some people now that are uh, working on Angelman syndrome research in Australia from the time that I was in Australia on sabbatical before. Uh, we worked with Fast Australia to actually um, set up their first funded uh, preclinical research study in Australia. So I like to think now that, my, that the sun never sets on my research program. I'm in touch with uh, Ingrid Mackendo every week by S Skype. And so, uh, so we have uh, research programs going on, on on both sides of the Pacific. And, uh, and I'd also like to uh, thank all the, the funding, especially from FAST and the fire team. And finally, I just want to say, if you ever decide to come visit my lab, we can show you the, the Jamie Berkeley imaging facility that we've dedicated uh, due to a, a, a grateful donation from that family. Thank you. Okay, same process as before. If anybody has questions for David now, we can have them now as we're getting our last fire team member and our newest fire team member wired up to give you a talk. So any questions for David or are we saving them for the panel? All right. Oh, Ann has one. How old are your rat pups? Well, they were born in October, so I guess they're a couple any, of months now. Any seizures? like clinical, just behavioral seizures? So we've not, yeah, we've not, uh, we don't have any information about that yet. I mean, if they're having frequent seizures, the animal caretakers will let you know. 
So yeah, so so it's also important to consider. So from the founders, we had a male and a female, and uh, we were concerned about the female because uh, because she might have pups with the Angelman phenotype. However, this wasn't a female that inherited the deletion from her mother. This was made in the embryo, and so we don't actually know which chromosome on that female uh, uh, was affected. And so, so we don't we yeah we don't have that information for the F ones yet. All right, let's thank David. <laughs>